come to God's word this morning, let's bow our heads and pray. Gracious and eternal God, we indeed do praise you and thank you for a new day. That each and every one of us here has been given a new day to live, to breathe, to feel the sunshine, and to be able to tell others about you as the Son of the living God. Lord, what grace! May you touch our hearts this morning and our lives today and help us not to squander the day, but help us to use it for your glory in every way. And Lord, as we look to this week ahead, help us to be a people who take a stand for you in all things. Heavenly Father, may you send your Holy Spirit among us today. May your Spirit speak into our hearts. May your Spirit impress these truths upon us to your glory. May you start with myself. And may your name be honoured and glorified for Jesus' sake. And God's people say, Amen. Amen. <clears throat> Turn with me in your Bibles to Revelation chapter 3. Revelation chapter 3. And we're going to be looking this morning at the sixth church of Revelation. This is the third message concerning this particular church. And it's the final message on this church. God willing, we'll pick up on the new church next week. Now in order to understand what we're dealing with here, we need to ask the question concerning this church at Philadelphia, and that is, when is it right to take a stand? When is it right to take a stand? And it's important to ask this question because we live in a world today of compromise. We live in a world today of rights and not wanting to offend anybody in daily life. And so when is it right for you as a Christian to take a stand? When is it right to take a stand? Well, just a simple story on this. In the 1840s, there was a preacher by the name of Reverend H. Ward. And one day he told the story of when he was at school. And he had a very stern and strict and harsh teacher. I don't know if any of you have had a stern and strict and harsh teacher. You can remember them. I'm sure we all can. And on the first day of class, this teacher put up a mathematical problem on the board. And then turned and looked at Ward and said, Young man, what is your answer to this problem? And Ward stood up in front of the class, he was sitting right in the very front, and he gave an answer to the teacher, and the teacher turned and said, That's wrong. That's wrong. Very, very wrong. Sit down. And so Ward, confused, sat down. And the teacher turned to the next student and said this, and asked the same question. That student gave exactly the same answer. And then the teacher went from student to student, student to student, student to student. And eventually the teacher turned and looked at Ward again and said, Have you rethought your answer? What is the correct answer to this question? And Ward stood up and looked at the teacher and gave exactly the same answer. And the teacher turned and said to him, You're wrong. Sit down. And Ward looked at him in the eye and said, Sir, in all respect, I will not sit down. You are wrong. And the teacher turned and looked at him and said, Finally, finally, somebody who takes a stand on what they know to be right. Wow. And that was the church of Philadelphia. They took a stand for what was right and pleasing before God. And that is the key to taking any stand in daily life. Even if the world, like the teacher, would have turned and said that you are wrong as a Christian, they took a stand for what they knew to be right before God. What they knew to be right before God. And because of it, Christ turns and he commends them for their faithfulness. Do you know that there is not one criticism that is leveled against this church in the entire letter? For this was a church that knew the commands of Jesus Christ and they took their stand accordingly. Wow. This was a church of scripture. A church that loved God with all their heart and loved one another. This was a true missionary church. Or as Jesus speaks of it, the church of the open door. All because they were absolutely faithful to God in life. Turn with me to Revelation chapter 3 and let's read from verse 7. Revelation chapter 3, let's look at verse 7. Jesus says, To the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, 
These are the words of him who is holy and true, who holds the keys of David. What he opens, no one can shut. What he shuts, no one can open. I know your deeds. See, I've placed before you an open door that no one can shut. And I know that you have little strength. Yet you have kept my word and not denied my name. I will make those who are the synagogue of Satan, who claim to be Jews, though they are not, but are liars, I will make them come and fall down at your feet and acknowledge that I have loved you. Since you've kept my command to endure patiently, I will also keep you from the hour of trial that is going to come on the whole world as a test for those who live on the earth. I am coming soon, says Jesus. Hold on to what you have, so that no one will take your crown. Him who overcomes, I will make a pillar in the temple of my God. Never again will he leave it. I will write on him the name of my God, and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which is coming down out of heaven from my God. And I will also write on him my new name. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. And just a brief recap, and it's good that we do so. I'm sure we've all had such a busy week. Last Sunday's sermon's gone out the mind, and so it's good to have a bit of a recap. We have seen so far in our study that these seven letters of Revelation all follow a pattern in terms of the outline that we have been using. And the first title that we've got looked at in our outline is the correspondent. The correspondent. Do you remember that? Look at Revelation 3, verse 17. It says of this, to the angel of the church in Philadelphia, write. These are the words of him who is holy and true, who holds the keys of David. What he opens, no one can shut, and what he shuts, no one can open. Now again, as we have seen with each and every one of these letters, they are addressed to the pastor of each and every one of these seven congregations to whom the letters are written. And here this letter is addressed to the angel or in Greek, the spiritual messenger, the pastor, the reverend of the church at Philadelphia. You'll further remember that in all these letters, Jesus turns and identifies himself by a very, very specific title. A title related to that church's situation. So that what the Lord does is that he tailors his introduction to what is actually going on in that church to whom he's writing. And the description that Christ uses here in verse 7 of himself is that the first, is the first description that does not come from Revelation chapter 1. And that as you know, in the first five letters, every description of Christ comes from Revelation chapter 1. The vision of the glorified Son, the one whose eyes are like blazing fire, whose feet are like burnished bronze, whose voice is like the sound of rushing waters, but this one does not. And further, every single description of Christ coming in judgment is one of coming in judgment against those churches that will not listen to the voice of Jesus. But to this church in Philadelphia, there is no judgment. Because they were a true church. They were a Christ-honoring, faithful church. Isn't that glorious, amen? And as we lay this foundation principle again, just notice who the correspondent is. Look at Revelation 3 verse 7. It says, these are the words of him who is holy and true. Now that is how the Lord describes himself to this church. He is holy and true, which are titles that we find throughout scripture describing God. For example, in the Old Testament, God is called the Holy One. In Isaiah 43, verse 15, God says, I am the Lord, your Holy One, Israel's Creator, your King. In Isaiah 40, verse 25, God says, To whom will you compare me? Who is my equal, says the Holy One? In Habakkuk 3, verse 3, it says, God came from Tehran, Tehran, and the Holy One from Mount Paran. And of course, when we sit back and we think of the holiness of God, we are drawn to Isaiah chapter 6, verses 2 and 3, where it says of the great angels of God, the seraphim, and they were calling to one another, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is filled with His glory. Wow. And we see this again in Revelation chapter 4, verse 8. In the throne room of God, it says to the angels, 
Day and night they never stopped saying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and who is and who is to come. Wow. And so holiness then is the character of God. Meaning that the God of heaven is absolutely sinless. The God that we stand before and the God that we sit before this morning is absolutely unblemished. Utterly and completely perfect. This is the title that Christ uses to describe himself in this passage to you and I. In that Jesus identifies himself as the Holy One. And so what he's really saying is, I am God. That's what he's saying, I am God. And as God, he is turning and he's calling us and the church of Philadelphia, you and I here, to live a life of holiness. As the Holy Spirit says through Peter in 1 Peter chapter 1 verse 15 and 16. He says, but just as he who called you is holy, so be holy in all that you do, for as it is written, be holy, for I am holy, declares the Lord. And so no church, no church or individual ever became holy unless Christ became the absolute center and focus of their entire lives. Jesus Christ has to be the center of everything we do to live a holy life. We need to be a people in life who are Christ-focused, who are Christ-centered. Christ-focused in our thoughts, in our words, in our deeds, in our relationships. For you and I as Christians to be holy people. But the Lord is not only the Holy One of a faithful church, but He is also what? The true One. The true One. Look at Revelation 3 verse 7. In fact, the Greek word here, and we've studied all this, means that he is true in himself. That Jesus is the author of truth. He is right. He is fact. He is the gospel. He is the only one who can say, in terms of life and eternity, that he is always right. Jesus is the only one. He's always right. In John 14, 6, Jesus said, I am the way, the what? Truth and the life. No man comes unto God the Father, but through me. You want to go to heaven? Jesus is the only way to salvation. Not any other faith, not any other religion. Christ is the way. Which means that to live life on this earth without Jesus Christ is to live life without the prospect of heaven, no matter how morally good you might appear to be, and no matter how many times people might turn around and give you a compliment. And therefore, to live your life without Jesus is to live your life without any form of absolute truth. And just notice here that Jesus doesn't say to us, I give truth. He says, I am truth. I am truth. Truth is part of his nature and his character as God. It is who he is as God. And we spent a lot of time studying into this, and there's so much more here. And so again, I do encourage you to listen to the message, which God willing will post at the end of the service. We then looked at the church, and we said we don't know who founded it. We don't know who the pastor is. We've got no historical records of anything about this church except this letter. But most likely it was founded during Paul's ministry at Ephesus in Acts 19.10. We then looked at the city and we said that it was founded in about 189 BC by King Emmanuel of Pergamon. And he had a very protective love and a very protective care for his own flesh and blood, his brother. And so when he founded the city, they went to nickname the city, and it became the name of the city later, Philadelphia, which simply means brotherly love. And then last time we picked up on the first part of the commendation, the commendation, where our Lord Jesus Christ turns and he commends the Christians in Philadelphia for four realities that richly characterize this church. And in so doing, we looked at the fact that this church was the church of the open door. Revelation, look at Revelation 3, verse 8, Jesus says, I know your deeds, see I've placed before you what? An open door that no one can shut. An open door that no one can shut. Now listen. Philadelphia, says Jesus, has an open door, Revelation 3.8. Or that is, any church, any Christian person, 
in any age of world history that is absolutely in their hearts and their lives faithful to Jesus Christ has an open door spiritually before God and life. And what Jesus opens, Revelation 3 verse 8, no one can shut. It's Jesus who opens the doors of opportunity and Christian service to those who are faithful to Him in life. It's Jesus who opens the door to salvation. It's Jesus who opens the door to the eternal kingdom. It's Jesus who opens the door to spiritual blessings in yours and my life, which we so often desire and we seek. It's Jesus who opens the door to Christian witnessing where you're able to turn and tell somebody else about the, your faith in Jesus Christ. And for those who turn and reject Him, He opens the door to hell and death. It's Jesus. And as we pointed out last time in some detail, even the Apostle Paul was one who turned and recognized that Jesus Christ is the one who opens doors. As he said in 2 Corinthians 2 verse 12, just briefly, Paul says, Now when I was in Troas, I went to Troas to preach the gospel of Christ and found that the Lord, the Lord had what? Opened a door for me. Jesus opened the door for the church to grow. Jesus opened the door for Paul to be able to witness the Christian faith to other people. Jesus did. In John 10, 19, Jesus said, I am the door. Jesus opens doors and he closes doors. I wonder, how is God leading you in your life here today? What doors is Jesus opening for you? And what doors is Jesus closing? Now, as we draw this letter to a close, I believe it's important that we touch on these main studies uh, that we've looked at so that we get a fuller picture of this letter in our mind, of the church that took a right stand before God. Let's turn today to another uh, issue that needed to be commended. Look at Revelation 3, verse 8. In that not only did they as a church and as a group of Christians have an open door and went through it, where many Christians today are not taking the opportunities that God gives them for life and ministry, to do what is right before God, but this church of Christians, because they were willing to take every opportunity for Christ, became a force to be reckoned with. And this is quite something, because look at verse 8, Revelation chapter 3, Jesus, the all-powerful, all-holy, true God, says of them, I know that you have little strength. Yet you have kept my word and not denied my name well. I know you've got little strength, says Jesus Christ. Now that Greek phrase there, I know that you have little strength there, does not mean weak. Such as weak in faith, weak spiritually, weak as a congregation in daily life. No. But it means small in number. It means a small little group. It means small in the whole city of Philadelphia. They were just little. There was this huge city of Philadelphia. And there was this tiny little church. But you know, by comparison to the other six churches, who were much bigger, this church was powerful. It was powerful. Because as we have seen repeatedly in our study, they were absolutely and totally dependent on God. It didn't matter how small they were. It didn't matter how weak they appeared to everybody outside in the community. God could use them to literally turn the world upside down for the kingdom if He wanted to. Because they were faithful Christians in their hearts. They were faithful to Jesus Christ in life. Somebody has said, little is much when God is in it. Little is much when God is in it. In 2 Corinthians 12, 9, the Lord said to the Apostle Paul, My grace is sufficient for you. My power is made perfect in weakness. Or, in other words, in terms of your dependence on me. My power, says Jesus, is shown by your dependence on me. And what was Paul's response as a Christian? He said in 2 Corinthians 18, 9 to the Lord, Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about what? My weaknesses, my dependence on you as God, so that the Christ's power may rest on me. 
This is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weaknesses, in insults, in hardships, in persecutions, in difficulties. For when I am what? Weak. Then I am strong spiritually. Wow. In the 21st century today, Christians like to be powerful. They like to stand up and command in the name of Jesus Christ the powers of heaven and earth. That's a lot of the preaching today. Command it in the name of Jesus. You've got the power as a Christian. But in the first century, the Christians were weak. And they were the ones that God's favor rested upon. Those who were totally, absolutely, and completely dependent on Him. As children turning and crying out to a Heavenly Father, trusting in His will in all things, absolutely dependent on God. Wow. And Christ commends them. You know what's interesting? Is that very often we tend to think that we have to be thousands of people to have a testimony for God in the world, don't we? Thousands of people. Or that we have to be thousands of people to have God's commendation in life. And that God turns and says, well done, there's so many. Wow, well done. But as we see here, that's not so. They were little. To the world, they appeared weak. But to God, because of their dependence and their trust, they were powerful. It's a big difference. And then the Lord says, look at Revelation 3.18, and I love this. You have kept my word and not denied my name. Wow, tremendous. A faithful church is true to the word of God. They didn't deny his name. And oh boy, do we see that fast fading in the world today, don't we? Instead of the gospel being preached, it's now Christian motivational talks with trained motivational Christian speakers. Philosophy, Christian psychology, sociology, materialism, entertainment, replacing the Word of God. And the Bible for many has become an add-on. It's become a myth. So that people will listen to a story from the Word of God, from the pulpit, and it's a case of, well, that's great, I'm a Christian, but you know, that was 2,000 years ago. It doesn't really touch my life now. It's not really relevant to where I am in my life right now. And that is where my heart gets tough. In that we cannot tolerate any church which, which waters down or denies the Word of God. God's Word is absolutely above all things. All things. Sadly, that's not, not so everywhere. And then if you go and look up the requirements to do your doctorate in theology in some of our universities, they call it a doctorate in theology with a major in the Bible. And they require that one is to read 200 books on philosophy. Do a course on Jesus in the 21st century cinema. And then specialize in liberal theology, which denies the Bible and says it's the work of man. That's the way it is today, unless you go to a sound theological college. But this church here in Philadelphia kept the Word of God. These Christians were absolutely Christ-focused in terms of the Word, and that is what made them a faithful church to Jesus. They were a group of Christians who were built on the standard of Christ. And that a true church is dependent on God. It's Christ-focused. As they come to worship, they live their lives with their minds focused on eternity, focused on Jesus, focused on the Word from Christ. They hold to exalting Jesus above all things in life. Their homes, their relationships, their life. God's above all things. They honor Christ. And they stay in churches where the Word of God is preached. And then he says, end of Revelation 3, verse 8. Look at verse 8. And you have not denied my name, says Jesus. I just love that. They didn't deny the name of Jesus Christ. Wow. In Matthew 10, verse 22, Jesus said, And ye shall be hated by all men for my name's sake. You will be hated. This little church, the Christians there, in that tiny little church, in their daily lives, despite all the hatred of the world around them, 
They never denied the name of Jesus Christ and heaven turned and recognized it well. Now, what does it mean when we talk about the name of Christ? What is the name of Christ? Well, it means all that the person of Jesus is. All that the person of Jesus is. His life, his ministry, his death on the cross, the fact that he is the Son of God and the Savior of the world alone. That is the name of Christ. I heard a preacher this last week who turned around and said, the name of Christ is power. No, it's not. It is powerful, but it's not. It's the person of Christ. It's all that my Jesus is. That's his name. It describes him. Well, these Christians in Philadelphia, they never denied it. They were never ashamed of the name of Christ. But they proudly and boldly stood up and proclaimed Jesus Christ to all. Now I wonder, would you say that's something characterizing your life? In that you are somebody here who was willing and able and active in proclaiming everything about Jesus to all without apology? When you walk into the office environment, when you sit at that lunch table with friends and family, when you go out somewhere to the club or wherever, the sports venue, or wherever it is, and people start pulling the name of Christ down, or speaking in a derogatory name about Christ, or speaking about the Word of God and the Bible and about Jesus, are you somebody who takes your stand? Are you somebody who's willing to stand up and say, I believe? Jesus is my Savior, He is my God, and to do it without apology. It also means living a life that matches your testimony. Living a life that matches your testimony. Because remember, by the way you live, you can deny the name of Christ. Jesus says in Revelation 3.8, You have not denied my name. That's by testimony, and that's by life. Look at Revelation 3, verse 9. Christ further says, I will make those who are of the synagogue of Satan, who claim to be Jews, they are, they are not, but are liars. I will make them come and fall down at your feet and acknowledge that I have loved you. Wow! This is terrific! This is fabulous! Do you know who the synagogue of Satan is? Well, as you'll remember, when we studied the church at Smyrna, that is a reference to certain Jewish religious leaders at that time who in their hatred of Jesus were trying to persecute the church of God. They were doing everything they could to report the, those Christians and to find cause issues with the Romans concerning them. And they stood up and they called themselves the synagogue of God. Synagogue and assembly of people, the church of God. And Jesus turns here and he says, No! Your hatred of me makes you a synagogue of Satan. Wow, it's quite a thought, isn't it? That to deny Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior in life puts a person into the camp of Satan in the sight of God. Somebody turns around to you and says, I don't believe in Jesus and I'm not interested in your Christianity and so on. But I'm a good moral person and I'm just not interested in religion and I'm quite happy to live my life. Jesus sees you in the camp of Satan. Somebody turns around and says, well, I believe in God and I believe in church, but you know, look, it's not me, you know, I'd rather just live my life my own way. Jesus sees you in the camp of Satan. You see, there are no grey areas with God. We might smudge it and make it a grey area because we don't want to cause an offence to somebody. We just want to be accepting. But there's no grey areas with God. When we stand before God one day, you either know Jesus or you don't know Jesus. That's the bottom line. You either know Christ or you don't know Christ. Finish. And to deny Christ is eternal loss. Look at Revelation 3 9. Jesus says, A time is going to come when I'll make them come and fall down at your feet and acknowledge that I have loved you. And you know that we have started to see this prophecy or this prediction of Christ come to fulfillment in recent years with great, great effect. 
And then according to mission statistics, more Jews today are acknowledging Jesus Christ as Savior in His love today than non-Jews. There's a greater turning amongst the Jewish people to Christ than non-Jews today in the world. And this is exactly what Jesus said would happen in Revelation 3 verse 9. He says, I will make them come and fall down at your feet and acknowledge that I have loved you. And so we've seen the correspondent, the city, the church, and the commendation. Let's look now at the command quickly. Revelation 3 verse 11, Jesus says, I am coming soon. Hold on to what you have now. Watch this. So that no one will take your crown. No one will take your crown. You say, wait a minute, Mark. Just you wait a minute. I'm a believer. I'm a Christian. I've got a crown waiting for me in heaven. The crown of salvation. Isn't that right? One day when I come before God, I'm going to get a crown of salvation. Well, yes, absolutely. Absolutely. You accept Jesus as your Savior, and you will get a crown of salvation. Now you say, can one lose one's crown? That's right. That's right. Now what does Jesus mean by this? Well, listen. It is true that a Christian is eternally secure in their salvation because of the power of God. Yes. In that no one, no one can take your crown of salvation away from you. Yes. And yet, Jesus secures one's salvation by providing Christians with a persevering faith. That's the test. Let me explain this to you. According to 1 John 2, 19, those who say they are Christians in life, but turn their back on God, <coughs> they drop away from church, they turn their back on the Bible, they're full of excuses. You know, look, I, I don't want to go to church, you know, I've had enough religion pushed down my throat, I've been to Christian schools, I was stuck in this convent or that, whatever, and you know, I've just had too much, you know, I used to be involved at the church, and, and, and I used to teach youth work, and I used to do this, and I used to do that, but you know, this happened at the church, and I just don't want to get caught up at the church, and you know, there's hypocrites at the church, and so on, so on, so on, so on. They don't pray, they don't read the word. We all know people like that in daily life, isn't that so? People who profess Christ at one time, they carried their Bibles at one time. They attended church at one time. They were involved in the church in some form of ministry or some way at one time. And then they just dropped away. For whatever the reason is, they just dropped away. They never pick up their Bibles anymore. They're not really interested. They don't seek fellowship with the people of God. There's no desire to make Christian friends and to be involved in a Christian community. They just drop away. They were there and they just drop away. Well, according to 1 John 2.19, those who abandon their faith reveal that they were never truly saved to begin with. They lose their crown. Look at 1 John 2.19. John says, They went out from us, but they did not really belong to us. If they had belonged to us, they would have remained with us. But their going showed that none of them belonged to us. Wow. God's crown of salvation is for those who, despite the shocks and the traumas and the difficulties of life which so often hit you and I in daily life, faithfully endure to the end in their faith. Trials come into their life. They don't give up on God. They hold on to their Lord. And they carry on work, walking. They persevere. Or let me put it this way. Your faithful perseverance in your Christian faith to God marks you as a true child of God. And you need never ever fear losing your salvation. But if you have no commitment in your life, your language, your heart, your actions to show it to God, you were never saved to begin with. And you've lost your crown. See? Revelation 3 verse 11. I am coming soon. Hold on to what you have. Here it is. So that no one will take your crown. It's a warning from God. 
And then in closing, in Revelation 3.12, our Lord gives this church a final counsel. A final counsel. And this is interesting. He says, him who overcomes. Overcomes what? Sin. The trials of life. The difficulties that so often come into yours in my life. That persevering spirit in holding to the gospel. And who's that? But those who believe that Christ is the Son of God and the Savior of the world and persevere in faith. For those people, Jesus is going to do this for them. Look at Revelation 3, verse 12 and 13. I will make a pillar in the temple of my God. Never again will he leave it. I'll write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which is coming down out of heaven from my God. I'll also write on him my new name. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Listen. If you know and love Jesus Christ, He has got some things for you, and these are fabulous. Are you ready? Well, first of all, Jesus says, I will make a pillar in the temple of my God. Now, what is that? Well, in the ancient world, when a great senator did a great deed in life, and they wanted to mem memorialize him, what they would do is go to the main temple of their God and they would carve his name onto one of the big pillars of that temple as a constant reminder of that man's life and the deed he did. Well, you know something? In the eternal temple of God in heaven, right next to the throne of God in heaven itself, every single Christian your name and my name is going to be carved by the hand of God for all eternity as a memorial on one of those pillars. Because you belong to Jesus. One day you will see the glorious throne of God and you will walk into the temple of God around that throne and there will be hundreds of these huge solid stone pillars in heaven. And you'll look up and there will be your full name carved onto that pillar. And you'll look next to it and there will be your wife or your husband's name. And there will be your children's names carved onto that pillar literally by the hand of God in stone for all eternity. Carved because you belong to Jesus. That's fantastic. All because you were faithful to God persevering in your own faith. And further to this, Jesus says, look at Revelation 3.12, I will write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God. In ancient times, slaves were branded to show to whom they actually belonged. So that everyone would look at that slave and look at the branding and say, well, he belongs to so and so. Well, says Jesus Christ, one day in eternity, there's going to be no doubts about you. Instead, one day, God, by His own hand, is not going to brand you, but He's going to write on every Christian that you belong to God. And that your home is the new Jerusalem, the city of God. Wow. I don't know where God's going to write it on me, but there's going to be written there, Mark belongs to God. Home, New Jerusalem. Everybody's going to see it. Wherever I go in the universe, they're going to take one look at me and say, well, I know where you come from. That's it. You come from the Lord. Doesn't that excite you? And then look at verse 12. Jesus says, and I will also write on him my new name. Do you know that you will have the new name of Jesus written on you for all eternity? I don't know what Jesus' new name is. But one day the new name of Jesus, the name of God, is literally going to be written on you. One look at you and people will know automatically every being in the universe to whom you belong. And then says Jesus, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the church. Question, when is it right to take a stand before God? 
Well, this letter to the Philadelphia church reveals that the Holy God pours out his blessings on those who are committed to what is right before him. Who are committed to what is right before him in terms of faithfulness and perseverance to his word. Let's pray. As we bow before the King this morning, why don't you just give thanks to God? Perhaps you want to give thanks to God about your name as a Christian being inscribed on the pillars of stone by the throne room of God. That one day God's going to literally, evidently, before an entire universe, have your city, your address, your ID, inscribed on you. For all to see. That one day you're going to stand there with the very name of Jesus. His new name. Written on you. Every being in the universe will see it. Maybe there's something else you want to speak to the Lord about. Why don't you just take a minute to do so. Perhaps it's thanks. Perhaps you're somebody at times who doubts your salvation or the fact that you can ever be a Christian. And yet God says the very fact that you persevere despite all the trials of life shows that you are my child. Gracious and eternal God, we bow in humility before your absolute magnificence, your power and your might, your sovereign and almighty God. Heavenly Father, we just want to praise and thank you for the thought that one day our names will be inscribed on solid stone pillars for all to see, that you will inscribe your name on us in the name of your Son, his new name. That our very location and dwelling will be inscribed upon us for all to know and for all to see. In a world where there will be no more suffering and no more pain, no more illnesses and no more hospitals, no more death and no more cemeteries, but a world of righteousness and grace and peace and the love of Jesus Christ. Wow. Lord, we cannot wait for that world. How our hearts long for that world. And that you're a God who says, my child, do you want to know if you're really mine? Your perseverance in your faith says it all. Gracious Father, we thank you for everything. We praise you for everything. And we give you glory before the entire universe. May your name be glorified and honored this morning. And God's people say in Jesus' name, Amen.